wow, God is so great. God is so great. But we have somebody that is going to share just a quick testimony with you because she knows how great God is. She knows how good God is. And just take your liberty. Praise the Lord, everyone. So tonight, I just want to thank God for saving me and to encourage somebody else in this place. So as most of you know, I grew up in the church, but at some point, I decided to walk away. I walked away from God, and I decided to take my own path. And the biggest problem with that was that I didn't know in my own mind that I was lost. I knew the direction I was going, and I knew where I wanted to be. And I didn't know I was lost. And it took years for me to come to that realization and to go to myself and say, what am I doing in this place? I don't know where I am. I don't know where I'm going. And I feel stuck and confused and lost. And I couldn't find a way on my own, but I knew where to turn to, and that's Father's house. And if you look at the parable in Luke 15 of the prodigal son, he walked away, and he just destroyed everything that was given to him, and he didn't know what to do, but he knew where he could find the love, and that was Father's house. And just like that prodigal, Jesus saw me a long way off, and he ran to me. And I just want to tell someone tonight that there is a lot of worse places than lost as long as you don't remain there. See, if you're lost, you're in the perfect position to be found. Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. And so if you're lost tonight in this place and you don't know where to turn to or where to go, I just want to encourage you that if you turn to Jesus, he will meet you right where you are. Hallelujah. I'm so grateful that God would, would, would leave the night. We have a shepherd that would leave the 99. For that one, that he sees us precious enough to forget all that's there. But because there is that one soul, there's that one soul. Hallelujah, right? Praise God. I'm so grateful for the mercy of God that he loves us so much. I'm so grateful for that. And we are indebted to him. But I just, as the ushers would come, I don't know who would do it. You guys are getting off free tonight. Oh, okay. I see. But as the ushers go around to collect, just let's stand together again and just keep our eyes focused on Jesus. He's in this place. And let's continue to entertain him and see what he has for us in store tonight or in store for us tonight. In Jesus' name, hallelujah.
Take me as you find me All my fears and failures And fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender Savior, He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save actually gonna say I don't know if I'm allowed to do this but I was gonna see if you, you would re-sing that second second verse and go into the chorus but everyone ditched me you know you can because I just I just feel like I'm just so I love that part even just in the chorus you know it just it's 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 all about just giving it back you know, it's just who he is. I want to. I just want to continue to praise him for a little longer. And 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 over, if you could just. I want to praise him just a little bit longer before. I believe God wants to do something, but He inhabits the praises of His people. And you want to know what? I feel like He's not. He's not done hearing our praise and our thanks to him. I don't believe that. And there's such a sweet presence of God in this place that before we get into the the the, the word and, and and the preaching, I just want. I just want to continue to praise him a little bit because you know what? Everybody in this place, he took us as he found us. All our fears and all our failures and he filled our life again. We were broken and we were lost and we were just devastated and we were just, we were out of the hands of God. But in this place, in this place tonight, we give our life to follow. Everything we believe in, we now surrender it to the feet of Jesus. We are now in his hands. So God, take me as you find me. All my fears and my failures, my, my faults, 
Lord Jesus, take it and have your way with me in my life. And as we begin to sing this again, this second verse, she's such a sweet girl. She, she, she is. No, it's, it's I, I choke up a little bit when I hear her sing. Because when I came into the church in December, I'm going to make this quick, but when I came in December, I've seen her and Sam grow so much. And this is, a, this is a girl who has allowed God to take her fears and failures and fill her life. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Take me as you find me All my fears and failures And fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I surrender I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Before you guys are seated, I would just like to turn to the, the book of Numbers, chapter 23, verse 19, and I believe we'll be going to 20. It's, um, I'll just quickly say that I showed Dennis what I feel like I was supposed to, what I was going to preach on, and when I was at work, my break, I was reading, and I read this, and God said, this is what I want you to read. So, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not a human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Praise God. Listen, I receive a command to bless. God has blessed and I cannot reverse it. I didn't give them a title, but if I were to title 
anything that I'm going to, what I'm going to speak on is if he said it, he's going to do it. So before we sit down, let's just give God another hand clap of praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. God will give us a promise that sometimes is too hard for us to believe. But if he said he's going to come through, he's going to come through. And I have some scriptures from Genesis up there. I think it's 18 and 10. But before I read that, sometimes God will give us a promise that looks like it's never going to be fulfilled. And we begin to think that, you know, it's, it's ourselves thinking, God, the way this looks right now doesn't look like you're even going to do it. And sometimes we begin to doubt him a little bit. But that's why I'm here to build your faith and remind you that it's never too hard. In Genesis 18 and 10, then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. And Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, How could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? Especially when my master, my husband, also is so old. Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. I I think it's pretty amazing that he said it, she doubted it, and the exact same words came back out of his mouth. He didn't change it. He didn't rephrase it. He didn't, he didn't accommodate to what she was thinking or what she had to say. What he said is what he said, and what he said is how it was going to go. And then nothing changed his mind. Her doubt didn't change his mind. You know what? God will say things to us, and I was telling Caden um, earlier this morning that, you know, God was saying things to me, and I begin to doubt it. And I would say, well, God, what if this is my flesh and this isn't you? But he'll... he'll He'll show you that it wasn't him, or sorry, that it wasn't you and it was him. But any time in the Bible that God had talked about coming through for his people or if he told them to go in and inherit a land that they would, they would take it over and he, every time he would tell somebody or tell people in the Bible that they were going to go do this and this is how it's going to be done, it happened that exact way. So I I want you to know today that if you have a promise from God and sometimes it might not look like it, you have the promise from God. You have the promise from God. So just continue to trust in him even if it seems slow and if it seems like it's taking too long. It doesn't matter if you think it's too long. It's not your timing. It's his timing. So keep your eyes focused on him, stay strong, and keep encouraged, and just keep trusting in him. The Bible says in Psalm 27 and 14, wait patiently for the Lord and be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. So just be patient. It might not seem like it right now. But he has a plan for your life. He has a plan for your life. So don't worry. Just keep trusting in him. Galatians 6 and 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We have a promise for this church. Brother Dennis had prophesied and said that this church is going to double. 
if we do not get tired and if we do not faint, we will see the blessing of the Lord. We will see this church doubled. And we are going to see that this church can't hold, this building cannot hold. There's 81,000 people in, in Peterborough right now. So we cannot hold the revival that God is bringing. God has been unifying us and taking us deeper. The church that I came to here April 27th, 2021 is not the same church it is today on April 3rd, 2022. We are growing deeper and we are going stronger and I am seeing faith build on a constant basis. I am seeing us trust in God, but if we do not faint, if we do not grow weary and we keep trying, we will see this place double. We'll see it triple, bro. I'm not worried about that. Double's too little. Let's not put God in a box. We're gonna see God do some great things and, we, and, and we're gonna see the backslider come back. We're gonna see the prodigal come home and we're gonna see them take take a hold of the giftings and the, the callings that they once let go. I know for a fact, firsthand experience that even if you leave and you go off and do your own thing and you can try and stay away all you want, but you're not going to get in the way of what God has said. So might as well just get on the boat now. Get on the boat now. I never thought that before. Prodigals are coming home because God is opening the door to the ark and we're going home. But there are some people, oh my gosh, we're going home, oh my gosh. We're going home. But there's that one person. There's that one person that God is just waiting for. Just trust in him and give yourself to him. Do not get tired. Do not look at the things of this world. If you're at home and you're online and you're watching the service, come home. God is waiting for you and he's waiting to change your life. Get back in the boat. Get into the boat. Get into the ark. Time is running out. Time is running out. Get into the boat. Get into the boat. Hallelujah. But they that wait, this is Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. Wait upon the Lord. Trust in him. Trust in his timing. There is an anointing for you. But because you don't see it right away doesn't mean that it is not there. Because you are not operating in it, in the fullness of it right now does me does not mean that it is not there. You seek God's face. You talk to him. You build a relationship with God and you will see things from him. You'll see a side of him that you never knew you could experience. But now I'm just going to say real quick, as a personal story of mine, and I'll I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm going over. But when I was 12, year, 12 years old, I, had a, I was at the altar call with my mom. And um, the, 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 the evangelist, Brother Cornelius, had stopped the altar call. And he pointed at me at 12 years old, hallelujah, and said, in 10 years, this young man's going to be a preacher. I backslid and I did my own thing, and I cared about nothing else but myself. But God saved me, and right before my 23rd birthday, I found myself on a plane going to Bible school in New Brunswick at the age of 22. 10 years, 10 years, hallelujah. Now, by no means, you know, by no means was I a preacher when I was on that plane, right? By no means. But God realized that if I don't do it right now, I have made myself a liar. God saved me 10 years after I was prophesied over. My God is not a liar. And if he has promised you, Sister, Sister Crawford, you're going to see that. 
Hallelujah. You've been prophesied, you too, about the sands of the sea. You're going to see it in Jesus' name. You're going to get a great reward in heaven, Tara. I'm telling you this right now in the Holy Ghost, that you have a promise. You're going to see it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You have a promise. You're going to see it. I want you to know that if God has told you something, trust in it. Do not get weary. Do not get tired. Do not faint. If you feel like you can't keep going, keep pursuing God. Pursue God. Pursue God. If there's anything I'm learning in these few days and few weeks is get a relationship with God and you'll experience a side to him that you have never thought you were able to experience. And he is going to come through for you. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just praise the Lord. Lord, we worship you. We thank you, God. Lord, we pray that into our lives, God. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep running, God. We're not giving up. We're not turning around, God. Whatever comes our way, whatever is in our path, God, you are the way. You are the light, God. I worship you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. You are holy. You are worthy. Hallelujah. Um, I just want to say first and um Thank you to Brother Crawford for letting us young, all the young people, even me, <laughs> be able to, um, you know, serve up here and pursue callings that God has placed on each and every one of their lives. And I'm incredibly behind each and every one of you, and I'm so excited to see where God's taking you and where God's taking us as a group, as a whole, and even as a church. <laughs> um, you can stay seated. I just have one quick scripture. Um, For everything there is a season, a time, every activity under heaven, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. Sorry, just let me get my little story. We are all aware of the four seasons of the year, but do you understand the four seasons of life? A king had four sons. To teach them an important lesson, he decided to ask them to visit a cherry tree in the deep forest of their kingdom. During the peak of winter, he asked his eldest son to go and see if the tree and write a description of the tree. The prince came back and told that the tree was barren, old, and hopeless. Not even birds are coming near the tree. It looks useless. Maybe it is better to cut it down and to use it before use it for wood before it rots. During the middle of the spring, the king asked his second son to visit the tree and write a description of the tree. The prince came back and told the tree is not barren. Rather, it is full of beautiful cherry blossoms and it looks young and promising. The tree is surrounded by butterflies and bees who are enjoying its flowering. Then in the summer, the king sent his third son to go and see the tree and come back with a description. When the prince returned, he told that there were, are no blossoms. Rather, the tree is loaded with delicious cherries and looked mature and valuable. Many birds are living on the tree and enjoying the fruits. Finally, in the autumn, the king asked his youngest son to visit the tree and bring back a description of the tree. The prince returned and described that the tree has no fruit or flowers, as his brother described, but it looks beautiful as it is colored leaves with lovely shades of gold, red, and orange. It looks like an ideal place for an object of a painting. And I think when we look to our lives, how often do our lives look like that, right? How often do our walk with God ebb and flow and our highs and our at lows, right? There's many seasons in our walk with God. You know, there's the dry season where you feel that God is nowhere to be found and it seems that his voice is lost to you and you feel like you're walking in the desert and there's only sand to wear on you and there's not an oasis in sight or water to drink and the word falls flat, right? And you seek and you're just just okay, maybe if I have one more step this way or one more step that way or where am I going to go? What am, I just don't know, God. I just don't know. As all you feel is the dry and the barren, right? But that's when God wants us to keep walking, to keep going, to keep searching for that oasis, right? Because this word does bring life. It does bring hope. It does bring newness. Then there's the waiting season, 
You're waiting for something to come to pass, a circumstance to change, for purpose to be revealed, right? And this one's a hard one. A dry place is hard, but it's kind of like you're just kind of wandering through it. You don't really have no aimlessness in it. There's not much you can, there's nothing there, right? But in waiting, it's like, okay, I know this is what I want. I know this is what you promised me. And I'm going to drive myself nuts, right? Especially us warriors, right? <laughs> because you have something. You know something's there, right? You're waiting for that call to be fulfilled, that purpose to be shown to you, right? It's anticipation, right? And it's not easy always to sit on the sidelines or sit on the bench and watch somebody else running off and being busy. And but what about me? Right? That's what that season is. You know, young people, this is for you. This season often ties into singleness. If you're single and you're praying for your husband or wife to come, do it well. I read this. Do your season of singleness singleness with dignity and joy and enjoy the blessings of being independent borrowing from tomorrow will only rob you of all of the blessings that you can enjoy today travel grow friendships fall in love with God and everything he has for you because when you get married it's a lot of work (laughs) um and also you know, it's hard. I remember. I remember what it's like to be like, well, maybe they're the one. Oh, wait, never mind. No, absolutely not. Mm-mm. Thank you, Jesus, for not letting that one go through. Can I get an amen in the back? I mean, <laughs> anyways, but that's where all the TBC people are that know who I dated. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> um, you, you do, you walk through, you're, you're just like, oh, is it ever going to happen? Am I ever going to meet that one, the, the love of my life, right? And then negativity sets in, right? Whenever that cloud of negative thoughts start descending in your mind, be prepared to fight it by thanking God that he's protecting, blessing, and preparing your husband or wife to be. Ask God to prepare you to, and to prepare your ministry and whatever God has in store ahead of you. That time of waiting is there for a purpose. It's there to prepare you, to make you ready for whoever you're going to fight with for the rest of your life. (laughs) And then there's the busy season, the grinding season, right? This is most likely your purpose has been revealed and it's time to get to work. God says, here you go. I'm ready for you to go. I'm ready for you. Let's go. Hop up. Come on. Get off the bench. This is where I've called you to be. This is what I've called you to do. Let's go. Let's get running. Right? He's given you your purpose. And it becomes busy. And, okay, i got to be here. i got to do this. God, okay, I've got to hear this and that and this. and Right? And it's great. It's a wonderful season to be in. It really is. You feel fulfilled. You feel purposeful. You feel like, oh, I finally got it. Got it figured out, God which is great, but we have to make sure in that season of busyness that we set our priorities, right? That we make sure God's first, our family's the next, you know? And that we have room, to, we make sure we still have that room to grow and to find rest in Christ in our season of busyness, not to become overwhelmed by it, right? And then there's the test and the trial season, Right? This is the season of breaking, a stripping away of the old, and God calling us to a higher purpose and removing the things that are holding us back. And this seasons are the worst of the worst, or at least it feels like it. In reality, they're probably the best of the best when you look back and you've been like, okay, I get it now. I understand it now, but then I absolutely did not get it. I did not understand it. I did not want to be there. I did not want to be the pearl in the mouth of the oyster being worked on. Absolutely not. I don't care about the pretty gold thing I am now that the, you know, that they fill the gold in and the broken piece. I don't care about that in that moment until afterwards, right? And then you know, God, you brought me through that for a purpose. You showed me that plan. You know, you, you did all of that because it was all a part of the purpose. And then there's also a season of spiritual warfare. This probably means 
you're doing something right. God is making headway, and hell is sending everything against you to try and stop the will of God from making sure you're uh, to stop the will of God. And this is often a lot of times in our life we face this. And sometimes we don't realize it, but other times it's really in our face. Sometimes it's really strong, and it's really coming at us. And that's when we have to make sure that we're girding up, right? That we're putting on the whole armor, like in Ephesians 6. We have to make sure from the top of our head to the bottom of our feet that we're walking with God, that we have him first. Because when all of hell is coming against you, you aren't going to be able to do it by yourself. You aren't going to be able to stand on your own two feet. You're going to need a mighty God, right? We must realize that seasons have a purpose, and we should do our best to present Christ well through them. And that's not easy, always. When you're in the word and when you're praying and you're seeking God, it is. But sometimes in those places, those, those things seem lost to you, like I said. And we, oh, I'm just going to, okay, I'm going to sit in church today, and, <clears throat> you know? I've definitely been there. Whatever. In one ear, out the other. I'm going to, whatever. But that's not representing Christ well, right? It's not showing the hurting people that are going through their own season that God's got it. Whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain. Because her hour has come, but when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because the joy that the child has been born into the world. Therefore, you too have grief now, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. John 16, 21, 22. And it's so like that. Every woman in the room that's had a child knows this. We're insane. We go through childbirth. We do insane things. We tolerate a little one. And then yet, we want another one, right? (laughs) We did it. We made it through the season. But it was great joy in the end, right? So it was worth it after all. And that's how seasons are. It's painful. It's hard. It hurts. It's stretching. It's growing. But at the end, there's great joy. And let us not grow weary for doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Galatians 6 and 9. So how do we do that? How do we not grow weary? First and foremost, the unconditional love of God, right? Without God, it's null and void. We're not making it through it, right? He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaves do not wither and all that he does, he prospers. Psalms 1 and 3. We must learn to lean on God and his word. We must allow his grace and mercy to flood our lives every day. The second thing is the unconditional love of others. We must allow others room to grow and fell, yet love them anyways. And we need to remember that for ourselves, right? We're going to fall. We're going to make mistakes because we're human. We're not perfect. We're far beyond perfect. Nobody in this room that I know of has ever gone through walking, walking with God perfectly. If you have, wow, great job. Please, let's talk afterwards because I have definitely had a lot of boo-boos, okay? In my darkest hour, people who let me weep openly share my innermost thoughts. People who thought, man, she is an idiot right now. But that's okay. I know she's walking through something. And I'm going to love her through it. And those people, I'm going to pull this up before I. Those people were my arm bearers. And you say, what 
is an arm bearer. That's kind of a word I made up. Maybe it's not, but I feel like I made it up. Anyways, if we look in the book of Exodus 17, while the people of Israel were still at Rephidim, the warriors of Elimelech attacked them. Moses commanded Joshua, come some men to choose some men to go out and fight the army of Elimelech for us. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill holding the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did what Moses had commanded and fought the army of Elimelech. Meanwhile, Moses, Aaron, and Hur climbed to the top of the nearby hill. As long as Moses held up the staff in his hand, the Israelites had the advantage. But whenever he dropped his hand, the Amimelites gained the advantage. Moses' arms soon became so tired, he could no longer hold them up. So Aaron and Hur found a stone for him to sit on. And then they stood on each side of Moses, holding up his hands. So his hands held steady until the sun set. And as a result, Joshua overwhelmed the army of Elimelech in the battle. Are you somebody's arm bearers? You know, Moses may have wanted to, the battle to be over quick. He thought, I'm going to stand here and I'm going to raise my staff and hopefully Joshua will get this done over and quick, right? Because if anybody, if any of you in here have worked out and done an arm exercise where you have to hold your arm up for a long time, it's not easy, right? And he had a staff in his hand as well. He was probably hoping for a quick victory to be able to put his arm down, and, but he was holding his staff up for somebody else, right? So that Joshua could win a battle, right? And then his arms grew weary, right? So he's standing right here, right, letting, helping Joshua fight the battle because every time he would weary and get, put his arms down, the battle will begun to go in the enemy's favor. So then that's when Aaron and her stepped to the side of Moses and said, in your weariness, I'm going to lift you up. <laughs> right? I'm going to stand on your side of you and I'm going to hold your arm up if it takes however long. And they did. They stood at his, hot, his, at his side and held his arm strong. And they won the battle that day. Right? In walking in seasons, we have to learn vulnerability and we have to learn trust, right? People aren't vulnerable because of pride. I can't share my story with anybody else because I can't let them see that I'm in a hard place right now. I can't let anybody know that I'm failing right now. I can't let anybody know that this perfect persona that I'm putting on is failing, right? I can't ask anybody for help. I can't be vulnerable. And we don't trust people, right? They might tell. They might, they're going to think awful of me. I'm never, if I tell them, they're never going to see me the same again. I don't know if I can trust that person to, to love me through this, to not hurt me, to not slander me, to not talk against me, Right? You know, one of the reasons why gossiping is not gossiping is so important is so that when you go to your brother or sister and you pour out your heart, you know that it's going to stay between them and God. Your heart stays right there, and it doesn't go anywhere else. You know what hurts the most when you're in a hard place? is the fear of walking through the church doors because this and that has been said and not one person will look you in the eye. Some of that is spiritual, but some of it is just plain humanness. We have got to learn love that costs us precious time, right? We have to learn a love that I can have to, I'm busy right now. I can't. This person's calling me. I don't have time for this. I don't have time to sit down and talk to them. I don't have, my day is packed full. 
No, we have to learn love that makes us give up our precious time, right? We have to learn love that will put somebody above the thing that you love more than anything, right? We have to learn that as Christians because we are called to love like Christ and his love is unconditional. Um, at, at Bible school, TPC, um, Brother Wolford um, often taught on David and he loved to speak about David. And one of the things that always stuck with me, and I think it probably sticks with most students that go through his, through his uh, teaching or lessons, is he talks about dancing through your trials and your seasons. And he talks about how David danced in his hard times. And David worshipped and gave it all to God. And he told the, he, I don't know, I, I, I assume, but he tells every class that goes through his thing, if you're ever in a situation or a trial or a desperate place, all you have to do is text me dancing. Or all you have to do is put on Facebook dancing. And then instantly, an entire group of people know, I'm in a desperate place right now. I'm in a place that I'm just dancing because that's all I know how to do right now is dance my way through this and give it to God. And instantly, because I've seen it, I've seen it come through my Facebook page from students that have walked through TBC's halls. And I instantly know, oh, I need to touch heaven for them right now. Right? That's why being a unified church is so important. Is that so when somebody's dancing, that we can be their arm bearers and we can stand at their side and we can say, you've got this. I'm dancing with you. I'm touching heaven right now for you. You can be vulnerable with me. You can trust me. I've got you through this. This doesn't stop once we leave these church walls. It's checking in by text or going for a walk or a lunch chat. Ministry doesn't only happen in these walls, like Dennis said this morning. I would say a lot of ministry probably happens outside of these walls, right? Yes, we have to make our own final decisions Nobody else gets to decide how our seasons end, right? Whether we choose to go through them gracefully, whether we choose to go through them bitterly, whether we choose to continue it on and on and on and on and on, even though God sometimes gives us the out and we still choose the trial or the, the test or the dry place, right? We have to make the final decision. There's, there's just no other way around it. But how much easier is it to go into battle when you have an entire army at your back? How much easier is it to travel and pray and touch the hem of his garment when you know you don't have to press through a crowd because they've already said, no, I've got you. We're right here. We're going to do this. We're going to get there together, right? When you have those people that are going to help you, to move you along, to be your arm bearers, to be at your side. We invest in people's seasons to get them through and to celebrate in people's good and to encourage them in their growth, to tell them, to, to tell them, I see how far you've come. Glory be to God. All glory be to God, not because of what I did, right? Not because of what you did, but we did it together because God has instructed us to, right? To care for our brother and our sister. Um, I'm, you can all stand. Terry, you can come to the music. It was funny because this actually came out of a discussion with Andrew about what we were going to be talking about, or what he was going to be talking about. He told me what he was going to be talking about, but I think it changed since then, but that's okay. But um, 
we were sitting there and we were talking. And I kind of went, oh, God, I got an opposite thing of what he has. Maybe my thing's not right, you know, like, oh, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's my flesh, you know. Maybe I'm not in the will of God of what you want me to speak on tonight. And then it dawned on me. It was along the same lines of this message. It was more about investing in people's miracles. But <laughs> I, I sat down and I thought, I was like, oh, no. And I was driving home. It was after a Bible talkie. And I was driving home and I was just thinking over, like, well, God, what do you, what do you want me to talk about? What do you want me to preach about? What do, you want, what do you want these people to hear? And I realized and it dawned on me that Andrew and I are in different seasons in our walk with God, right? In different places, right? And I was like, oh, okay, okay. We're not wrong. We're just, God's dealing with us about different things, right? God's calling us to different places right now. And it kind of amazed me, and I was just like, okay, so God, you, you want me to talk about seasons. I, you want us to realize that our brothers and our sisters walk through different things than we do, but we have to be there to help them through. And I, I realize that so much of our messages right now and lately have been about the coming of the Lord, but it's also been about unity, right? God has called this church to a high place of unity because this church will not move forward without it, right? And so I just want to encourage right now before I end. Some of you are walking in dry places. Some of you are walking and waiting. Some of you are busy, right? And that's great. There's every different type of trial going on in this place right now. And some of us have been doing it alone when you don't have to be. Because there's a church right here who God has called unto unity, who God wants to be, wants them to be your arm bearers. So I'm asking you right now, you don't have to tell, you don't have to, whatever. Whatever your season of life it is, maybe it is just busyness. Maybe you're doing great things for God right now, but you just want to make sure you're staying on the right path. Whatever it is, I want to ask you to come to the front right now and be vulnerable and walk up here if you're in any type of season in your life. Anybody? If you haven't walked up here, I want you, if you feel like you're in a great, a good place in your life right now and you don't need any type of help, or maybe this is my other, my other thing. Maybe you know of somebody who's not here tonight, that they're walking through a place and they're walking in a, in a place and they need somebody to stand in the stead of where they're at you can stand for that person tonight. But the rest of you, I want you to be arm bearers tonight. I want you to come and I want you to hold these people's arms. I want you to take on the obligation of praying with them and for them, to check on them, to stand in the gap for them, to weep with them, to be vulnerable and to make sure that they have your trust. Past today and till the moment where you can dance together in victory. Make sure, though, if you choose to be an arm bearer this day, that you are ready for this responsibility because it is a responsibility to walk in somebody with their season. Because their soul is at stake. So if you choose to be their arm bearer, you have opened up and said, I'm going to carry you. I'm going to hold your arms up as long as this takes. No matter what it takes to get you through this, I'm going to weep with you. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to show you God's unconditional love. So right now, you just raise your hands. And everybody else, if you could just gather around these people that need arm bearers right now. And you pray with them. God, I worship you. I praise you. Oh, God, you see each and every people in this place right now. Oh, God, I need help. Oh, God. 
Hallelujah, God. Lord, help us to be 